The new normal requires new networking strategies to reopen, remobilize, and rebuild operations using human ingenuity, inspired creativity, and applied digital innovation. Join us for an exchanging of ideas and a showcase of strategies from our customers across multiple industries. Welcome to our first interactive session in a series of webinars establishing the new normal. With rapid transformation across every industry, we've been adjusting operations for business continuity and safety for our current reality, which has encouraged a collaborative effort across the board. But there is another side to that coin. Recognizing that social distancing won't last forever and that the technology we've adopted to support it now can be and will transform and introduce us all into the next wave of digital transformation. Joining me today, I have a panel of experts across multiple industries. They're all gonna help us dive into what the industry and technology trends are, what their strategies are to reopen and rebuild, remobilize their organizations, and what we can expect from an IT design considerations perspective as we support the new normal. Now, let's get the ideas flowing. What's it been like for Extreme, the impact that it's had, and you know the, the industries that we've seen impacted as well? Sure, so as a technology provider and a manufacturer, we've seen a lot of different uh, things, uh, impacts. We started in January and February with supply chain impacts, which we were able to mitigate, but those continue with logistical challenges that are gonna flow through, we believe, for the next six to, to 12 months even uh, in terms of impacts to moving materials between countries, locations, et cetera. Um, and then on the, the demand side for us, what we saw across the board was a mixed, you know, mixed results. We saw demand in certain areas, i.e. moving people to the work from home environment, create an acceleration of demand in some categories. And then in other categories like hospitality, healthcare, or, or think of travel and, and retail, these areas had different types of impacts that were negative where people would, uh, organizations didn't know when the retail stores were gonna reopen, organizations didn't know when travel was gonna resume, hotels were gonna, were gonna reopen. And so we've seen a lot of projects continue to be pushed, but it all depends on the vertical and, and, and frankly, the location. For us as an organization, we moved very quickly, almost overnight, from you know multiple locations into uh, a work from home environment, and our IT departments have made a lot of collaborative investments that made it possible. Uh, and and it's it's interesting to hear. I, I agree with everything that was said so far on the panel. It's it's different, and you miss a lot of the interaction. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get to a point where we'll be back uh, interacting with each other in a more closer proximity than this digital forum. Absolutely, we're social beings. We need to be around each other to be inspired. But I will say that the creativity and collaborative efforts that have come out of the pressures the pandemic has applied across IT functions and the business units within all of these organizations has been very positive and a bit of a silver lining. You know, in hockey, they have a saying that it's best to skate where the puck is going, not where it's been. I'm curious if we apply that to our current situation, where do you see the workplace and industry trends moving toward in the future? So that, yeah, and that statement is, you know, categorized as hockey and it was uh, Wayne Gretzky. And we asked him on stage <laughs> last year at Connect, you know, what did he mean by that? And it was, how do you anticipate the next move? How do you ca calculate and understand within the confines of that environment where you believe you're gonna go? Because the way he thought about it is, I'm not the biggest, you know, hockey player, I'm not the fastest one, but I'm gonna be the one that understands where to go first. And that's the trick. And wh where do I, you know, where do we see the world and the environment uh, being over the next 12, 18, 24 months? You know, I think uh, certain sectors are, are, are disrupted for a very long time. I think travel and I think, uh, you know, 
a lot of hospitality is going to be impacted. It's going to be very different. We're going to hear from one of our panelists what, what they're looking at for the NFL season, for example, this year. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of things that are just going to be, you know, different. And, and some of that is, is good. Um, the good is uh, I think we're going to be a lot more mindful and cautious about a lot of our activities. I think organizations such as us may re-examine what our physical footprints look like. And I think that, uh, you know, we're a heavy travel organization. I, you know, I travel three and a half weeks a month typically. And I think we're definitely rethinking that because we can interact with people. We don't necessarily have to hop on a plane to go have that one hour or two hour meeting. And I think personally, that's a benefit. I, I like that. I'm not sure if my family likes that, but uh, I'll like uh, <laughs> I'm not traveling quite as much. I'm sure they enjoy having you home. <laughs> But I do, I do concur that uh, traveling has been a big part of our lives. Yeah, and just like Ryan was saying, uh, you know, too much of, of a good thing is, is too much thing. So being home, going from traveling all the time to being home all the time, you know, there's a balance in there I think we all need. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. And to touch on the topic of healthcare, you mentioned, you know, several industries are being impacted. I'd like to hear from Mike related to healthcare and what he's been seeing in the transitions from a workplace and workflow perspective. You know, right now we're seeing digital adoption for remote services, telehealth, for example. Will we continue to see an emphasis and an expansion of digital healthcare services in the future? So I think digital healthcare services have been on the cards for a number of years now. The difficulty has been um, moving both our patients and our clinical workforce to adoption. Um, the, 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 uh, the coronavirus has very much accelerated that and you know we've moved the, the vast majority of our um, hospital patient consultations to either audio or, or, uh, or video conference. And the public's taken to it very well. I mean, we forget that almost everybody, no matter their age, carries a smartphone these days. A lot of people are very used to using technologies. The banking industry has been there well before us. So I don't envisage us going back to healthcare as it, as it, as it used to be. I think we'll see a very different healthcare system over the next couple of years as we come forward. The other big accelerator has been um, about information sharing, like all healthcare organizations around the world. Um, we have uh, elements of information that are pertinent to the care of our patients that are have traditionally been locked in silos. One of the things that COVID has really driven towards now is getting that information to the clinicians so they can make an informed decision about their patients. And our government has very much taken the, the shackles off IT, relaxing all of the procurement rules and allowing us to exercise the agility we've always, always had. And in my own area, you know, we've, we've managed to connect over 300 health care entities together very quickly and to make that patient data available. Initially, we thought we'd need that to drive the sort of Nightingale type hospitals that we, we put together in London, where we thought surge numbers were going to be very large as they had been in both Italy and Spain. Um, but in reality, it's proved to be much more effective in terms of delivering not only the health care we need for COVID, but actually all of the health care that we need and therefore, I can't see us going back. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. And to the key there, not only adoption, but also the compliance and regulations that would sometimes adhere our solutions and our workflows and our business models to the confines of the hospital walls. And for rightfully so, right, wanting to protect the, the patient data and information and certain things, it, it, from an accessibility perspective, remote access with the right audience, or the right authorized viewers of that data. However, I do see that it's possible, and I would love your opinion, that regulations compliance as they vary by region, by country, will also shift to accommodate the digital, the digital hospitals in the future, the dig digital services that we would expect as a new standard because of the benefits and silver linings we've seen from just what you've described. So I would fully agree with that. I, um, I, I think collaboration um, doesn't just exist within a single country. People move around. 
and therefore the ability to join up, um, you know, a patient's health data and have it available wherever it's needed is very much where we're going. Um, you know, we know that some of the, the, the mobile uh, technology manufacturers, Apple, for example, have launched a, a health record. Uh, we're engaged with them in terms of looking at that, looking really to enable the patient. A lot of healthcare traditionally has been done to a patient rather than the patient being the initiator or the enabler for that. And for patients with long-term conditions, that's been available for a while, but never really been adopted at scale. And it's that sort of shift to putting the patient in the driving seat, having that information available where and when it's needed, and becoming much more agile in our ability to do things now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. And we don't have to. I mean, I heard somewhere that information security should be something that enhances what you're doing as a business. And the same is true with healthcare regulation. Yes, we have to protect the data. Yes, we have to make sure that we're, we've got the necessary things in place to avoid cyber attack and all the rest of it, but it can't be at the expense of delivering better quality healthcare. So I'm excited to see the future of healthcare as we move forward. I'm sure that we'll continue to evolve and expand that adoption of digital health services. Mike, thank you so much for sharing. I would also like to pivot to education and hear from Ryan, your perspective on where the trends are moving towards in higher education. You know, you have all these students basically going virtual overnight. You guys are a well-established university over 200 years old, and you switched to online learning in about two weeks time. That's incredible. But also I'm sure that pivot has introduced some trends that you foresee becoming the new standard in education. Can tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think first and foremost that higher education does do a better job when students are in class interacting with their instructors and students directly. But we've also seen how having the flexibility and being able to deliver a class online has been critical to the continuation of our mission to educate. I think for us, we need to have the ability to operate as many classes as possible in a flexible manner. And I think given that UNC is an elite public institution, our students are gonna expect us to have high quality, flexible teaching uh, methodologies. So I, I, I consider online education uh, components to be table stakes for a lot of those students. And if we don't come to the table with leading the way with an engaging high quality online experience, then we're likely going to see the quality and number of our applicants decline. Um, I think probably one of the key challenges is actually generating engagement uh, through a learning platform. So that's going to be something we're going to have to take a strong look at. Uh, in addition, because the pedagogy has changed so much, I think there's going to need to be a lot of investment in course design. And uh, with that in comes a lot of instructional assistance with all these remote learning mandates. Very good points. Engagement, I hear you saying a few times throughout that, and I couldn't agree more. It's student retention rates, student performance, they show to be significantly increased when you have the student life engagement within student affairs, as well as throughout the online learning or the in-person learning experiences that they have. You talked about online learning methods. Are there going to be more digital programs to try to connect and create a virtual community? Uh, yes, um, the I would say the university is definitely focused on that key component. Some of the stuff, the things that you might think of the immediate, for example, we have a, an immediate need for there's a significant number of students that cannot travel um, from their country of origin to the United States due to the current situation. So being able to give them the Carolina experience uh, from abroad is at least for a full semester is super important uh, with the uh, housing department. Housing is doing a lot uh, with regards to uh, involve students with one another digitally. Esports initiative is actually a pretty big thing that they're bringing online soon. So uh, yeah, there's definitely a tremendous amount of emphasis on how to bring all these students together uh, online. 
Well, I look forward to seeing how we creatively devise different ways to virtually engage the student body across distributed environments, those overseas and in the US, they certainly need it. I would love to move over to sports and entertainment. Of course, we all love the NFL Patriots, or maybe you don't, but we do all love a combination of entertainment of sorts. Mike, Michael, you are with the Craft Group and it is a unique bird. You have multiple business units covering multiple industries or categories within industries. You have retail, hospitality, you have even healthcare services, manufacturing, but of course, sports and entertainment is the one that most people are itching for at the moment, being able to go to the stadium, get that exciting experience, that adrenaline rush, watch the games going into the future. What are the trends we can expect to see come out of sports and entertainment to engage the fan base? And what kind of events will we see coming back into the venues? Well, good question. I, I think you will start to see some of the more mainline sports uh, start to follow some of the leads that have been um, outlined over the last several years with esports, as an example. Looking at taking the the real core networks we have in this in the uh, stadiums and taking advantage of 5G and our extensive Wi-Fi network to extend the the stadium experience to fans at home or in other locations. So how do you take uh, an, an uplift to what you would typically see in a stadium firsthand and extend that into people's homes. Um, very similar to watching uh, esports on, on TV and, and, and that dynamic from that perspective. Um, but at the same time, on a day-by-day -day basis, how we re-engage with our fans is very fluid. We hear different things from government officials every day. Um, so we're having to <clears throat> put plans in place to look at everything from how fans are going to when they come back, purchase food and beverages. How are they going to enter the stadium? Are we going to be looking at taking people's temperatures when they come in? How are we going to be looking at how we can get crowds into the, the stadium in a timely manner? And, you know, getting people to be able to, <coughs> to purchase food and to purchase uh, merchandise um, with as little interaction as possible. So. These are all things that are very different than how we've all come to, um, to to utilize a stadium type of or any retail environment in the past. So we're looking at how we change things up just to be more reactive to the times. Yeah, diversifying the the channels that you're using to engage with the fans, creating immersive experiences and unique experiences digitally, similar to watching esports, like you mentioned. But you also see, you know, pop ups. Uh, virtual reality studios that have that I've seen over the last couple of years take uh, take wind and and gain momentum. I wonder if we'll see things like that in the future of the virtual events that sports and entertainment offer to their fan base. You, you will see more virtual events, even if you look at some of our sports figures that we have. How how engaged they are in social media, how um, you know seeing more behind the scenes type of information. Um, how people are preparing for matches or games and then looking at the training that goes into this, allowing people to potentially in the future select their own camera angles when they're watching a game and, and be more engaging with the, the, um, the game or match itself. And if you think about, you know, historically, broadcasters have shown you different angles when we look to the future saying, hey, if you want to stop the action and look yourself, I mean, that's a trend that we may see in the coming years. I mean, it's very, very, like I said, fluid. There's, if anything, the it's pushing the technology advancement faster because you, again, we're, we're at home, we're, we're not uh, simply sitting and, and tailgating in a parking lot before the match. So, you know, people True. want that experience to be social. So how do we bring them together for the game, not just for the three hours of the game, but before and after. Yeah, I, I look forward to seeing that evolve over time. And I'm pretty sure we're going to see that very quickly as we move into football season coming in the fall. I would love to transition to healthcare and get an idea from Mike as well. 
what you've been seeing as technology trends have adopted and adjusted to the needs that the industry trends have seen in a digital healthcare environment. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So technology trends have been um, really in sort of three uh, pillars. Um, a lot of movement to far greater mobility. So um, moving away from desktop computers, fixed items to using much more in the way of laptops and uh, equipment that can, can work anywhere. And that relates also then to having uh, great infrastructure, because if you can't connect to a service, if you don't have the necessary, you know, connectivity, then uh, you, you can't deliver, you know, that change. So um, the investments that we've made in recent years as, we, as we've led digital forward in our country um, has been about building that platform to make sure that we can enable that change going forward. Also, the, the way in which we, we interact with uh, with our patients, you know, the, the, the supermarkets, and I'm sure it's the same around the world, moving to a sort of click and collect type model to minimise the amount of interaction between people. And we've seen that with healthcare too. So the ability to, um, you know, order, order your routine drugs um, and, and any other consumables that you, you might need for your, your healthcare, and then either have them delivered, huge uplift across the whole country in terms of uh, services that deliver to the home now. Um, and the technology around that. So, you know, when is it coming? You know, do I need to be in out and that sort of thing? Um, and then, um, as I say, looking at the way in which, you, you know, we work. So can we adopt artificial intelligence for image processing? Can we use machine learning to drive clinical algorithms to make decisions about, about patient self-care, particularly for patients with long-term conditions? You know, many long-term condition patients are actually quite well for for most of their life. So how do we change what is currently or has been in the past a regular intervention model to one that is more triggered by, um, you know, technology, being able to assemble blood results, um, you know, test local testing done at home, and, and, and that's driving a whole home hub industry. So can we install technology in the patient's home to allow the patient to gather that data quickly and easily, apps on mobile phones, wearable devices to collect that, you know, that digital information, and again, rather like Michael said, in terms of the machine learning, noting that there is a bail that's been there for longer than expected, the same sort of safety net built into that technology trend to say, you know, Mrs. Smith, um, her, her supply of whatever antibiotics she's using should have run out yesterday. There hasn't been a reorder. So we'll trigger a human intervention at that point. Someone will call, you know, find out, you know, what the cause of that is, check that she's not maybe been admitted to hospital, so she might actually already be in uh, either our institute or another one. So there are um, some very positive trends uh, that are emerging in terms of um, accelerating use of technology that we either already knew about or have been emerging in, 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 in recent years into real change in terms of how we use that to uh, reshape technology, going, uh, to reshape healthcare going forward. Absolutely, intelligently informed decisions based on real data that's being analyzed and insights provided back to the organization is very critical in those digital work streams that you just elaborated on and quite the digital experience, I'm, I must say, from a patient experience that we will evolve towards and be, become accustomed to. Thank you, Mike, for sharing. I would like to transition to education and hear from Ryan what it's been like from a technolo technology trends perspective in the university life. Obviously, students aren't there today, but we're clearly moving towards digital campus life, whether that's virtual online robust learning or esports or a combination of in-person and remote accessibility. What does the digital campus life, life look like and what tech trends can we expect to accommodate that? Yeah, so as you mentioned, we're definitely going to be seeing um, a hybrid approach with education. We certainly can't make the same assumptions that we made in the past when we assumed that we'd be instruction, instructing students uh, that were in, directly in front of us or what we're now deeming mask to mask instruction. Uh, so this is going to require additional investment in classroom technology to allow for the higher quality and more engaging remote learning experiences. Obviously, those investments tend to be very expensive. So in the past, the really high quality classrooms were really relegated to showcase rooms. They weren't really the norm. And that's something that we're gonna to have to come to grips with, especially as there's a funding crisis in the state. 
and we're not entirely sure what funds are going to be allocated when this is all said and done, how we're going to invest uh, in that technology um, going forward. With regards to like the network connectivity uh, in the residence halls, every institution really has to make sure they have the capacity to allow for remote learning. So fortunately, UNC invested really heavily in wireless deployment within the residence halls about uh, eight or nine years ago. So we have about 8,000 students that live on campus and about 3,000 access points. So that's about three students per AP. And we're really moving more towards a two to one. Uh, initially, when we did our first deployment, they were hallway deployments. And as we've recabled and life cycled, we move more in room uh, where we can. So what that does mean with uh, that type of ratio, our students can actually expect a really high quality of network service. And that's really needed when you're going to be expecting large numbers of them to be streaming classes from their dorm. So what was really interesting prior to all of this, the high quality internet access in the dorms was actually one of the cited reasons that housing was able to go from a 93% occupancy to 100% occupancy. Uh, it was like wow. one of the one of our greatest success stories that housing, you know, that's a pretty big hole to have to fill. And housing, they did all these surveys from all the students, and it turns out the internet connectivity in dorms is really critical to uh, getting those students in dorm for on campus housing in a really competitive market like we have around Chapel Hill. Uh, so for us, you know, the engagement is important on many fronts, um, and especially for residence halls, it's it's definitely not an afterthought. Um, I would state that a lot of institutions I've heard over the years have actually outsourced the networking component of the residence halls to third party right. providers, and we have not adopted that model. Housing does not want to adopt that model. In fact, it's uh, it, they really think that keeping a consistent continuity of service for all for students, be it if they're on campus proper in a classroom or in their dorm is pretty important. It's been interesting to hear from you how the technology will not only shift in the classroom to provide a more engaging hybrid experience, but also how the campus will adjust towards the shift and demand on the network as you go forward in education. Norman, I'd love to hear from you. What kind of technology trends have you seen on the rise amongst all of the industries that we support and how we've adjusted and pivoted our portfolio priorities and roadmap to accommodate a lot of the needs we're seeing come out of the examples we've been hearing? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Erica. And I think what we heard from the panel so far is how do we return to normal? And the, this program is under the hashtag new normal approach and each industry has a different approach or different aspect to it however there's a lot of commonality and themes so let's let's kind of hit on those for a moment what 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 we're looking at is how do people have the confidence to return to the retail store to the sports venue even to the hospital to get an elective surgery which is a big driver of the economies of scale within healthcare, we have to uh, work with organizations, we're working with our customers to come up with ways to help institute and create uh, more confidence in, in, in safety that they can move through and have an experience that uh, they want to have or have a critical treatment or be able to go to school uh, without feeling, uh, I think Ryan said the fear, but really the, the, the fear and, and be put themselves in jeopardy. So what, what are organizations doing? They're investing in a lot of areas. So the words out there today, contact tracing, uh, room management, high density, no touch uh, technologies, um, as well as uh, integrating to lots of different no touch type capabilities. And I'll, I'll spend a moment on each one. Let's start with uh, if you're going into a venue or a hospital or something else, you're going to want to have some initial screening for a no-touch entry. And so we're seeing our healthcare customers looking to integrate thermal cameras uh, into, uh, into our networking systems or into their existing systems to create an initial screening for people. And we're seeing our, our uh, 
venue customers looking at zero touch entry, zero touch, um, whether it's through ticketing or through concessions or, or other types of things which require high density. And then we're also seeing our education customers looking at how do we get uh, the students and faculty back into the venues or um, excuse me, back into our facilities uh, so that we can have a number of people in those venues and facilities and how do we support them while they're there. And that brings in a whole nother set of complexity in terms of whether it's, com uh, it's, it's contact tracing or room management, making sure things are cleaning. So let me talk about how the technology plays into that. So we think that the way to approach it is start at the very basic level, start with, hey, if you have a policy in place that says room counts, we're only allowing 10 people in a room. I'm just making up a hypothetical, but 10 people in a room. Red light, green light, 10 people are in the room, red light uh, when 11 people go in. There'll be an alert sent out or communicated with happen electronically through alerts or different types of things. You take that same, uh, call it sniffer, if you will, or, or uh, capability, and you apply that to well, has this room been cleaned after the 10 people leave? Is there a cleaning protocol or another procedure that needs to go into place? And the, and the capabilities with IoT and different types of sensors are out there that can articulate and communicate, this has been cleaned or this room is red light, green light, ready to go. So start with the basics in solving the problem. And then you move up the level in terms of complexity. Some of the most complex problems to solve are around contact tracing. And we hear a lot, Google, Apple, governments, World Health Organization talking about contact tracing. And that's really at the, think of it at the community level, you know, and there's four levels of surveillance. There's community, campus, building, person. And I'm the fine. community level, exactly. And you fall all the way through and the phone is a, a key attribute in that. And you think of it at each level, they're considered levels of surveillance. Well. The community level is going to be set by governments, World Health, you know, potentially Apple, Google. The campus will be set by organizations like like Ryan's or or even when I say campus, it could be the manufacturing facility. It could be the hospital. Those will be set at the local level. They'll be using applications that will be geofenced ways to sort of let people know what's going on if they've been in an area for a certain amount of time were they exposed and just to let them know that if you're exposed, you should be aware, you may not have any symptoms, you may not have anything wrong, but we just wanna let you know you're exposed. Then you get into the more complexity of the building and the person. The person is more the wearables or just personal understanding. Uh, and, and the building is where we play uh, as an organization where we have the most, I'll call it impactful technologies. We can support all of these levels around contact tracing but we do that by understanding where people have been how long they've been there and who's been around them during that time period and you can look within a data set across a very wide time frame in fact one of the technologies we have is unlimited data which means you can store your data forever as long as you're a customer so you can look back whether it's today it's about COVID-19 but in the future it's going to be about you know, marketing and it's gonna be about understanding and it could be something non-tragic, something very positive. Uh, but today that's that's the real use. Yeah, and so we're seeing all these things happening and our customers are resilient. That's what's amazing across the board. People were frozen in time in March. Nobody knew what to do. And uh, there was tons of concerns. What do we do? How do we do this, etc. Now you're hearing, just listening to the panel, People have turned the page. You know, manufacturing is happening. We're moving forward. Trucks are moving. Consumers are coming back into stores. People want to get back to life. Students want to go back to school. We all want to do things that are, you know, what we're used to. And that's the resiliency of this. And that's what's going to help us evolve. Technology is just, from our perspective, we provide a support mechanism to help make that happen. And it is different across the board, depending on who it is or what your function is, but there's a lot of commonality and there's some terrific ideas. I think one other thing, Erica, is that a lot of concepts that people have been kicking around for years, um, and, and Michael said that, Mike and Michael said this, um, a lot of things that have been around 
for years, you know, telemedicine and, you know, oh, geez, we can order in seed or we can do kind of walk through concessions. All of that's going to be accelerated. All of those things that have been sandbox are going to be accelerated and made much more prolific. And those are the types of advancements and innovation that are going to come out of this. Absolutely. It boils down to, you know, what I was sharing with Michael or with Mike earlier related to healthcare. It, it's data informed data points that allow them to intelligently automate business decisions across the board. I'm curious to also hear from the rest of our panelists and their perspective, given the industries that they're representing. Ryan, if you don't mind, I would like to pivot to education and hear your perspective on the IT considerations that you would recommend and the IT strategies you've already had in place that allowed you to shift in a matter of weeks to 100% online learning. So I would say we were really fortunate that we made a lot of long-term investments that allowed us to make the quick pivot. So, you know, we had basically two weeks, we had to convert a 230 year old university from traditional institution of learning to being completely online. And that was a ridiculous task. You know, it was not only was it shocking that we were not allowed to show to work, show up to work and we had to work remotely, but then we had to basically convert all this uh, over two week period. We were able to do it because we had so many things the university had invested so much uh, already in IT to get prepared for this. So we had what I would consider a great mixed uh, hybrid clouds uh, approach in which applications that would need to be scaled quickly um, and easily were, had already been made. Uh, Zoom was obviously a really good example of that. We had a really good, uh, robust LMS platform. Um, and, you know, the people, uh, we, we're talking about obviously the technology, but the people are incredibly important because without the people, we wouldn't have had um, the, the infrastructure in place to help the professors train to prepare them for what was to come. Many of the professors, you know, prior to all this didn't know what Zoom was and they had to become <laughs> experts overnight, uh, you know, on what remote learning, you know, looked like, uh, you know, and our people in teaching and learning, helping them to design these classes almost overnight. So there was just a massive amount of, uh, of effort that we put there. Um, interestingly enough, you don't know what the future is going to hold, you know, for, um, you know, state budgets, et cetera. But I would say um, this is probably the one of the high points of my career as far as being an IT professional and being able to contribute towards such a, you know, large cause. You know, it's it's the university already has a really great mission, but for IT folks, um, oftentimes we can be seen as a cost center and to see that that transitions from, you know, from being a cost center to basically being a partner with university to allow them to do something they've never, never done before, not at this scale, uh, it brings a lot of pride. And I think if there were any doubts from the university about why they had been investing so much in IT over these years, I think that this is the year that those doubts have been removed. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Related to, you know, preparing as the students will inevitably return to school, as you mentioned, could very well happen um, at, you know, in the fall, we're expecting this to happen. What kind of precautions are being taken? As Norman mentioned, occupancy management, contact tracing, these are things that would put the community at ease as parents send their kids back to school, as yeah. universities take responsibility for the staff and students being together. Do you call it mask to mask contact or mask to mask learning? Is that what you called it? That's correct. So I will state this is evolving. So um, what I say now will absolutely evolve. Um, I a lot of universities are, you know, it's really, as I mentioned prior to the call, you know, somebody asked about what's what's going on for spring semester. And I was like, I the emphasis is on fall because it's hard to predict one month ahead, let alone eight months ahead. Uh, so the university is basically they're looking at this from multiple stand, multiple fronts. So to begin with, I think most universities 
they're starting early. So uh, UNC is starting its first day of class is August 10th. Normally it's toward the very end of the month. There's not going to be any fall break and the class is going to end at Thanksgiving. So we're basically condensing the class schedule um, and reducing the opportunities for students to bring in or go outside of the university and bring things that we don't want to have back into the university. Um, housing has a really great plan to protect and mitigate risk uh, for, from, for the student body from suspected positive or known positive. So they've got plans for immune, uh, immunocompromised students, uh, students that think they may be infected and obviously the ones that we know. So they've got all this categorized. Um, they've got additional flexibility uh, for the types of rooms. On the class standpoint, the university is kind of going into subdividing classes into different categories based on necessity and risk. Now, they're, they're doing their best not to set a really hard template about this is the way it will be. They're trying to set a template of the way they would like to have things uh, be done and then allowing the individual schools some leniency on basically how they adopt uh, some of these rules. So, uh, for example, uh, on with for a lab, for example, a lab is not exactly something that you can easily substitute for a remote learning setup, you know, a, chem a chemistry lab, it's, it's impossible. So those classes will take place in person and they're gonna require masks. So then you have on the far extreme, the really big classes. So these are a lot of the, what you would traditionally think of as 100 series classes. So those classes, um, the university is, is per trying to in, uh, push towards those classes being considered very high quality online learning classes. So not to have those classes in person, but to produce basically a very high quality online experience uh, for those classes for e-learning. And then you have the stuff in between. So a lot of the, you know, the more uh, major focused classes um, that, you know, once you get through the 100 and those classes are going to be a hybrid approach where you may have uh, one group of students that comes in and is in the room uh, for the class one day while the other half is in their dorm, uh, you know, listening along. It could be asynchronous or synchronous learning. So we've got kind of those different approaches. Um, the university is also looking at um, PPE supplies, uh, you know, where needed so that, you know, we don't have to worry about those particular issues about people not having masks if they don't have uh, availability. So the short of it is the university is really emphasizing safety in every decision they're making. And when I say this is fluid, the university is continually listening to the healthcare experts to decide how they might change or adopt these strategies because quite honestly, we're all learning on the fly. I, I do wanna mention Absolutely. that when it comes to contact tracing, um, universities, I would say better than most places, we actually have a lot of experience already with traditional contact tracing because we have meningitis scares. And so campus health is very used to performing contact tracing. Um, we are exploratory, we're exploring ways in which we might be able to utilize technology to increase uh, that contact tracing ability, obviously because COVID is gonna require a different scale than we've seen in the past. No, you're, it's absolutely true. I, I am very interested to see how we continue to evolve though. As you said, we're all learning on the fly. We're all adjusting in real time, it seems, which definitely boosts the confidence of the capacity we have to, to adapt quickly. Um, so the short term, it sounds like, and the strategy for UNC is to really prepare with precautions that are centric around the safety of the students going back to the campus. And the strategy also includes a hybrid approach, which though it's the short term, would likely stick and become a long-term standard to engage yeah. with students in the hybrid model. Yeah, absolutely. Right, I, I do That's want to make an emphasis though, that it's not just the students. So the safety of the students, the faculty and the staff and everyone that comes to the university is, is paramount. So the university's being extremely inclusive and trying to design something and options that everyone can feel safe returning to work returning to school, whatever that may look like.
I think that's a big part of it, the, the fear factor, the unknown, the uncertainty of what the environment will be like coming back together as was, you know, without social distancing. And so going into a phased approach is, is best to tread lightly in education, in stadiums, in events, venues, but also adopting the technology to be as well informed as we can be so that we have you know, actual data points behind some of the decisions that we're making as we as we evolve and adapt on the fly. Getting the perspective of Mike from West Suffolk NHS, I would love to hear from you what is happening from a, a strategy perspective in the in the short term, but also the long term for healthcare at NHS. You mentioned that you know your your go to mantra is, and I quote going digital. So you all have been adopting digital transformation and evolved technology, emerging technologies for quite some time. How will that continue to expand across your environment and your use cases for NHS? So I'm very fortunate. I, I work with a board of directors who um, have very much recognized that digital is a key enabler going, going forward. And um, have chosen to invest in digital and to see digital as a key component of our strategy in order to be a leading hospital um, you know in our in our country um, that will very much continue it's interesting Erica when we, we first had this conversation the first thing I wrote down was great infrastructure because one of the things we have invested in heavily over the last five years is actually putting that infrastructure into place and an echo, the comments that Ryan made about you know that that investment around getting great quality wireless in place, getting high speed you know uh, net land you know sort of uh, land based connectivity in place, making sure that you know we've got wide area connectivity to any of the outlying areas that we support as well, they are really key in order to be able to to take things forward. In terms of our strategy, I think there's a couple of other things that really spring to mind. I, I pick up on um, uh, your COO's point about um, the um, green light red light thing, so looking to exploit that technology so that as we start to separate the hospital so we already have our a specific entrance that's um uh, you know demarked for patients who are coming in having been screened for covid and likely to be a covid patient we're already starting to separate the traffic in the hospital so i very much envision almost a, a one-way system around the hospital where um you know depending on whether you're coming in for covid or something else you have a different arrival point we have car parking in all sorts of different areas around the hospital and again looking to segregate that and then using some of that technology you know perhaps using rfid tagging or something like that to actually stop someone who's in the non-covid side of the hospital when when they start to stray towards the COVID area getting a warning you know getting an, a, an audio announcement if it's a mobile phone or whatever to say you know you really need to stop and, and turn around there's also a big change in the way in which we do projects traditionally healthcare has been always about uber safe so quite long periods of testing and uh, evaluating and whatever what we've learned with with covid is to look at innovation now more in a fast fail sort of uh, position you know we can throw some money at this we can quickly find out whether this is going to deliver the benefits that we want and as part of that what we're seeing is pressure from us um, on our supply chain to say we need you to make changes to things we need to have the software adapted or we need to be able to add some some functionality to the hardware not in weeks and months but in hours and days and i think right. that is where we'll see the strategy going forward will be about faster turnaround um, use of the technology very much to um, enforce our, our safety measures because quality and safety will always be our number one agenda items and exactly as, as ryan suggested looking to move in a fluid manner because you know as he said we might be able to predict where we go in the next month but you know beyond that it's impossible to see will there be a, a another surge we're releasing patients uh, reducing lockdown letting people um you know go out more mix more whatever corona is a contact virus if we suddenly start to see an increase in the infection rate then that will change the way in which we react and what we do operationally but really, um, it's about exploiting the technology. It's about making sure that we can react, we can provide things that people need and flexing how we work in order to do that quickly. 
So it sounds like the short term and long term strategy for NHS is short term. Make sure that there is safety enforced into all of the workflows, segmenting physically and virtually when possible the services that are delivered, how the patients engage with the clinicians. And you have such a strong foundation, as I stated already. Uh, and I look forward to seeing how that continues to evolve. But to your point, just taking it in short term cycles as we identify what the impact is as we return and strive to ramp up to 100% operations and back to business as usual, so to speak. Did I get yeah, that so right? The other, the other big enabler will that, will, for that will be testing. So right at the moment, uh, we're still um, you know, researching and working on finding a reliable antibody test that we can operate at scale. Um, and I think, you know, once once we get that over the line, then the ability to be able to, if you like, clear people. So, you know, we know you've had the virus, therefore you are unlikely to become reinfected because you're carrying antibodies and therefore you are clearly safer to work in a, you know, in a, in a high clinical area interfacing with patients. Also, we have a whole ongoing risk assessment process. In fact, this afternoon, the, the next generation of that risk assessment document has come out. Again, just wanting to make sure that as we start to think about people coming back to work, we aren't putting anybody you know, in harm's way that we've done a thorough analysis of you know, whether they should be, if they do come back, can they come back fully, can they come back partially? Um, and you know, again, looking at all those things that, uh, you know, that have come up already around um, you know, sort of managing space, managing distancing, and it, and it will be a, a real blend of some uh, meetings will be mask to mask. You know, there will be the necessity for people to come together and look at things in a, in a, in a physical capacity. Some of it will be, um, you know, a mixture of technology meetings and some of it will just be good old fashioned conversation, um, you know, by phone or whatever to say, you know, what do you think about this and how do we go forward? And um, it, it will be um, a new normal. And, and uh, for me, the, the drive for this is to sustain the agility. We've shown what we're capable of doing when under pressure. We've delivered enormous change in a very, very short space of time. Um, and I don't want to lose that momentum, that, uh, you know, that desire to, to drive change in. I mean, that's basically my job is to, you know, is to, is to champion technology and use it for better patient journey and better clinical experience. And I really don't want to lose the momentum that we have. I don't think that you'll lose it at all. I think you're gaining momentum, as you so eloquently stated, the exploitation of technology creatively applied to the demands that you're seeing and, and solving for. So pr the problem solving is, is at its peak right now across the board. And similar to you, Mike, stadium and entertainment has a bit of a predicament on their hands as they're shifting and pivoting to an environment where maybe it's not so safe or maybe it's frowned upon to encourage large gatherings. In some cases, it's banned completely as of right now. What does the strategy uh, look like for the craft group as you prepare to allow fans to return to the games and to enable a digital fan experience? Well, right now, it's a rather fluid topic. We, we wait on uh, direction from local authorities local government agencies. We also receive directions from the NFL or Major League Soccer. Um, and a lot of that hasn't been determined yet. So we don't quite know what a stadium environment is going to look like as we start to come out of the uh, of this epidemic. Uh, but from a planning perspective, we are looking at, okay, based on scenario A, B, and C, how would we engage? One of the things that we want to be sure of um, we're not a hospital, we're not a campus where we know who is coming in. We also don't want to be in a scenario where we're obtaining PII information that we shouldn't have and shouldn't need. Uh, we want to be able to monitor folks who are coming in, but at the same time not store that type of information. So we're looking beyond just technology and being able to scan people in mass quantities or uh, detect folks but at the same time, not holding any of that information. We want people to be able to come and experience the stadium, but at the same time, not worry about us, you know, collecting information that we shouldn't have. We're not a 
healthcare facility at the same time. So as we look right. to the future and we look to how we are going to um, be providing a safe and secure environment, we're also looking towards, okay, well, what does that mean from a compliance perspective as well? Um, so it, it's a variety of things that we sit down in, in small groups and say, hey, um, yes, I can understand you want to make sure that we are safe and we're bringing people into the facility in a safe and secure manner, but at the same time, 90 or 120 days in advance, we don't want to be getting a phone call saying, hey, why are you collecting that type of information? So um, we want to be cognizant of the restrictions or the compliance rules that were in existence even before this. Right. Absolutely. That makes sense. And completely understandable that there's not necessarily a solid game plan and yellow brick road to follow for going back full force to large gatherings at, at stadiums and, and venues like, like Gillette Stadium. But I do appreciate that there is a, a strategy in place to ensure the safety as best as you can by collecting the data points that, that you have when they're connected to the network, being able to leverage that and, as Mike put it, exploit that to ensure and, and, and impose safety regulations that are for the betterment of the environment Related to manufacturing, is security a part of your IT considerations uh, going forward, in, you know, preparing for safety and uh, connected manufacturing? When you talk about the increased use of IoT or the increase in the amount of folks working from home, you know, security is probably the biggest thing that we've had to deal with. Even, you know, when you, when you talk about network controls that you have in place, for our day-to-day -day environment. Once folks are in their home environment, that's a different story. We don't have control over someone's local network in, in their home. Uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of increased um, phishing attempts, impersonation attempts, those types of scenarios since folks have been home. And we've had to be even more village, uh, diligent in looking at where potential attacks are coming from. When you look at the use of IoT and bridging into the manufacturing process or even in a stadium environment, typically HVAC systems, industrial systems have not, they've been a very enclosed island-based type of, of scenario. And when you start bringing IoT into that, you have to at the same time make sure that you're putting security measures in place that in some cases haven't been there before because those production systems or development systems have been just off network and they've been self-isolated. So you have to be very careful from that perspective, um, whether you're healthcare or a campus or an environment like ours in manufacturing, these are typically areas that have been, don't touch that, don't connect anything to it or controlled by the manufacturer of that piece of equipment. So that, that's a piece right. that we have to be very cognizant of. Based on what you've shared with me today, the industry trends and where the craft group is looking toward from a vision perspective, we'll see more of that automation take place in the workflow streamlining that am amongst manufacturing environments. And I think that one of the benefits, as you mentioned, is really not, not just human error, but the safety of the, the plant employees as well. And so um, that seems to be like, a, a, like an exciting progression that will... Uh, result in positive impact for the employees and for the craft group as a whole. Thank you for sharing. And I do want to get a summary statement from each of you on what are the IT considerations you would recommend for those that are designing for network either within the same industry or looking to consult and enable complementary solutions to help reach those digital workplace strategies that we mentioned throughout this, this conversation. Going around the horn here, Mike Bone, I think I'll start with you from a healthcare perspective. What are some summary strategy points you would recommend to other IT leaders in healthcare? Thank you, Erica. Um, I would start with invest in your infrastructure because if you don't have the platform, building anything is, is hard work. Have a look at your governance. You know, are you able to um, you know, reshape that to support what you're doing? Um, sustain the agility, drive, build off the back of the, uh, the, the, the restraint that the virus has put on to make us move more quickly. And don't be afraid to invest in something that might fail, because if you don't break a few eggs, you'll never make an omelette. 
Thank you. Very good and wise inputs. Norman, did you have something to add? No, I just thought that that was a great end there, Mike. Uh, Kanama without cracking a few eggs. And I, I think uh, along those lines, not being afraid to fail. So working, you know, what I would say is work with your, your vendors, the team around you. Everybody has the same common goals. And uh, we're just looking to try to help you be successful. And that's that would be a parting uh, comment for us on the vendor side as a networking provider. Absolutely, the partner and ecosystem is critical at this point. It's it's an open ecosystem that is enabling so much innovation and creativity to take place. From an education perspective, Ryan, what would you recommend as IT leaders within higher education strive to enable the, the student campus to come back to campus, but also create a hybrid approach as you were talking about? Well, I think we need to obviously, as was previously stated, continue to, to invest in the infrastructure. Um, but I actually would like to get a little bit in the technical weeds a little bit. And I would say that um, it's not really enough anymore just to deliver audio video, um, that we're seeing uh, demands for extremely, uh, extremely high quality, real time audio video and for networking staffs, networking managers to basically be prepared to know Dante, precision time protocol, all these real-time video applications uh, really well because we're being, being asked to do some really interesting things. For example, our music department, uh, which wants to have people practice together, don't want to have them practice together in the same room. They actually want to have them practice together in separate rooms. You can't really do that with Zoom. And so it requires uh, specialized software with a robust uh, back backhaul network to be able to provide that type of connectivity. So realizing that the commodity network that you may have is maybe uh, insufficient for your needs with regards to some of these extremely demanding audio video applications that were coming online and now coming on a lot faster as a result of social social distancing. Very well said. We are very dependent on multimedia platforms and channels to be able to deliver content, services, engage as we're doing right now. So speaking of media and entertainment content delivery, what kind of input would you provide, Michael, from the craft group perspective as you, as you have Gillette Stadium, NFL teams, and all of these events that bring people together? What IT considerations would you recommend for others that are looking to design for those types of environments? You know, adding on to what Mike and Ryan had said, we have a, we've made a tremendous investment in our backbone infrastructure. Uh, actually just uh, completed a, a, a core upgrade uh, with the folks from Extreme over the past several months. Um, so we continue to invest in engaging technologies, whether it's 5G, whether it's enhanced Wi-Fi capabilities, et cetera. But at the same time, what I would say to other folks is, you know, we went into this COVID scenario all rather quickly and jumped through hoops as we've done in, in the past being with I, being in IT um, to make sure all of our users or end users were, were being um, taken care of. But as this goes on, take a moment to step back and reflect on what went well, what didn't go well. Um, before you're making finalized plans, think about project management, uh, governance, et cetera, as, as Mike was saying, but really more uh, importantly, um, learn from the past three months as you start to plan out the next three to six months. So uh, we, we only get better based on what we learned from the past. Absolutely. Hindsight is always 2020, right? And lessons learned will be a critical part in successfully moving forward. I thank you all for joining and sharing your unique perspectives from the different parts of the world and different industries that you've been representing here today. I'm excited to see the future. Make sure you tune in to June 23rd webinar series as we start to talk about security and cybersecurity trends that are happening across the world as a result to the pandemic and what you can do to prepare for that going forward. And unfortunately, we don't have time for a Q&A. We hope that we answered the majority of your questions as best as we could during the presentation. Thank you for participating and joining us. Until then, we'll see you next time.